Uh, my particular intervention or, or offering here is uh, called Apology to Stylistic Investigation. So I'm especially interested in the rhetorical form of apologies. And in particular, I want to highlight uh, a distinction which is kind of obvious, but uh, maybe gets lost in the focus on apologies as um, pledges of sorrow or uh, uh, admissions of guilt, and that is the classical rhetorical form of the apologia. Uh, so I want to go back to a couple of uh, uh, canonical apologiae uh, and talk a little bit about each of them and why they matter and how they function and then bring it up to date with uh, a, a nod or two at uh, contemporary apologetics in modern media, especially the what I, what I want to call the um, calculated abjection of the celebrity apology. Um, and then uh, and pose a question, I suppose, which is, uh, is it even possible to have uh, an apologia in the classical sense any longer? I mean, is our, our notion of the style of apology such that we can no longer imagine uh, anyone delivering an apologia in, in the classical sense. So uh, the Greek word apologia is um, a, a, a speaking about um, defense. It is a, a statement of principle in response usually to a particular charge. And I'll get back to the question of the relationship between charge and answer to charge. Uh, but uh, the most classic one, of course, in uh, the Western tradition is, is Socrates' apology, uh, the Plato's dialogue called apology. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with it. What happens here, this is the scene, of course, after the apology speech, right? Socrates delivers the apology speech to the Council of Athens, uh, and then when he's condemned to death, uh, nevertheless, goes into uh, prison here, depicted by uh, in the classical mode by David, uh, and drinks the hemlock and, and uh, executes the sentence of the city of Athens with respect to his crimes. And you may recall that the specific crimes Socrates was accused of are uh, corrupting the youth of Athens and praising false gods. So in the dialogue apology, uh, Plato does something very specific with the figure of Socrates. In later dialogues within the scene, within the, the <coughs> drama, so uh, the Phaedo, where, where uh, there's a discussion of the nature of the soul and what happens, and also the Mino, which is the dialogue where Socrates addresses the uh, offer of his cousin, Mino, to escape prison and avoid the punishment of that. There's a legalistic argument about how one should relate to uh, both the consequences of a legal judgment and the possibilities of evading that legal judgment. In the apology, which occurs before either of those, dramatically speaking, what Socrates does is something quite different. He offers a, a very uh, sharply and, and indeed provocatively ironic argument that uh, these charges brought against him are actually charges in favor of his citizenship. So this is already within the canon of, of Plato's dialogues, a significant departure. So uh, in, in both the Phaedo and the Crito, uh, Socrates is in effect uh, acknowledging and accepting his status as prisoner. And in particular in the Crito, he is arguing that the duty that he owes to Athens is such that he has to accept the judgment that's been brought down on him by, by his fellow citizens. Uh, you, you may remember the argument that uh, he has benefited from uh, being a, a son of Athens. He is bound by the law. And uh, though he could take this route of escape, which is offered by Crito in this little scheme that they have cooked up for him to uh, leave the city, uh, he can't do that, um, morally speaking. Uh, in the apology, he's in a different position or a different rhetorical position relative to the city, pushing back on the very idea that he's been charged with these crimes. And so the apology is, in fact, a spirited defense of the Socratic ideal. Uh, so the very things that he's accused of become virtues that he has brought to the city. And he turns the classic inversion of the argument. So um, 
corrupting the youth of Athens? No. Educating the youth of Athens? Praising false gods? No. Destroying easy, too easy belief in uh, pieties and, and idols that um, the establishment ha has accepted. And um, in the, maybe the most famous uh, passage in the Apology, he says that actually his, <clears throat> his sentence, should the Athenians judge him justly, is that they should, like the athletes of the Olympics, uh, give him free meals forever, <laughs> free meals for life, uh, crown him um, with, with uh, the, the, the traditional um, garland. Uh, so what Socrates is doing in that, in that uh, dialogue through Plato's voice is turning this around. Right? So uh, uh, praising false gods, corrupting the youth of Athens, this becomes a spirited and ironic account of his own value to the city of Athens. I want to suggest. Um, and in many ways, this, this is the model of the rhetorical form of the apologia for a long time. Uh, though technically it's merely a defense, uh, after Plato, there is a, a, a strong tradition, uh, rhetorically, of thinking of the apologia as an ironic inversion. Right? So taking the charges that, bring, that are brought against one and turning them around. Uh, this changes somewhat with, with the text, which I think is probably the second most famous um, apologia in the Western tradition, and that's Newman's um, Apologia Pro Via Sua. Uh, and you may recall the circumstances for this. So this is 19th century, uh, 1864, the, the Apologia is published, response to an attack on his personal and religious integrity by uh, rival thinker Charles Kingsley. And uh, it comes about because of Newman's resignation from his post as Anglican vicar of St. Mary's Church, Oxford, and his belonging to the so-called Oxford movement. Uh, so Kingsley's attacks, which were uh, ad hominem as, as well as intellectual, prompt uh, Newman to write uh, a book, Apologia Pro, Pro Vita Sua, is <clears throat> apology or defense of my life, right? of my life lived. Uh, and so his, his specific argument, his dispute with Kingsley, becomes the opportunity for writing, in effect, a spiritual autobiography. And so now we see, I think, uh, a new rhetorical flourishing, formally speaking, of what the ap apologia can be. Not just an ironic uh, inversion. He's not actually doing that, Newman, to Kingsley's charges. Instead, he's taking this as an opportunity to say, uh, how did I get here? How did, how did I become the person that I am, uh, religiously speaking, personally speaking? And uh, you know, the, the irony here, it, take a step back, the irony here is historical. Uh, nobody remembers Kingsley, uh, except as the person who <laughs> provoked Newman to write the Apologia. And uh, it's in print you know, um, it, it, every year since uh, 1864. Uh, and it's uh, partly because there's a persuasiveness there. It doesn't have the barbed intensity of Socrates' speech to the, the jury of Athens. It has uh, a much more, I would, I would call it, modern rhetorical style of personal persuasion, right? inviting the reader into the consciousness of the writer in order to share a certain kind of uh, narrative, which then becomes uh, self-justified. All right, so those are two uh, very famous examples of, of the apologia as defense. One, I, I want to call it the barbed ironic one, the inversion of charges. The other, a spiritual autobiography, if you like. Uh, and now we um, come to our own day and what has become to the notion of apology in, in public uh, discourse anyway. I did some, some um, brief online research, and I'm sure you, you've probably seen this, but you can find websites that list not only the top five celebrity apologies, but the top 10, the top 15. <laughs> then there are disputes. Uh, and what makes a, a celebrity apology a top one um, is also a dispute. Sometimes it's the degree of abjection. And that, that to me, is, is a part of the stylistic fascination. The, the abasement that is performed 
uh, in the apology. Sometimes it's the degree of fame of the person uh, executing the apology, right? So you have uh, you know, different people. These, these, these things fade very quickly in memory, but you probably remember um, Paula Dean, uh, Tiger Woods, and uh, <laughs> I'm, remember, I'm not remembering his name. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, uh, so each one of them within the last few years has, has uh, been forced to perform a public apology. Uh, the, the significant thing about this, like I said, is um, what I call calculated objection. And that is to say, uh, there's not any sense of pre-existing remorse or defense of life in these. There is a sense, rather, that uh, these people, because of their public profile, are forced into a position where they must execute this, this performance of, of an apology. And so the, the public apology, especially the public celebrity apology, but also the public political apology, becomes a particular kind of performative act. And it has various uh, aspects or tropes which are pretty consistent. The, there's the, the half admission of guilt. There's, there's rarely any sense that there is a, a genuine admission of guilt. In our, in a, I mean, I didn't update this today, but um, the Harvey Weinstein case, uh, what has he done in terms of public apology except things like, you know, I, I'm going to try to be a better person? Uh, or his defenders are saying, well, he's a, a dinosaur who needs to evolve, uh, even though that's a contradiction in terms of <laughs> dinosaurs don't evolve, they go extinct. Uh, <laughs> And so this, this idea that somehow uh, I've, I've been accused of wrongdoing, but I'm really a good person underneath it all, and I'll try to do better. So there's no genuine atonement here. Uh, there, there is very little attempt <clears throat> to repay any of the harm that's been offered. And most significantly, in terms of the, the, um, the declension from the apologia to the public apology, uh, there's no sense of, of a robust defense, and partly because that's that's impossible. Partly because the the behavior does seem to be indefensible. Uh, so we see, you know, very version various versions of that. Um, is it too late uh, now to say you're sorry? Uh, well, it, it, public relations executives will always tell you it's not, um, but it's, at a certain point it is because. When you're forced to apologize, it's not an apology. Uh, you know, when when there is this kind of begging of forgiveness afterwards, uh, you are in a position of, like I said, calculated objection, which is not actually performing any of the or executing any of the the things that we hope an, an apology will do, namely repairing wrongs, <clears throat> uh, atoning for damage, actually admitting guilt. And there, there are, I know we probably talked about this, um, um, there are various other structural elements of, of what a, an apology looks like, but those three, I think, are, are uh, necessary if not sufficient. Um, so the last thing I want to say um, is, uh, what can we think about in terms of our own uh, contemplation of the nature of apology? Well. I'm not sure that the, the apologia in the classical sense is going to come back anytime soon, although I can imagine certain public figures who might offer such a thing. You know, I can imagine, say, uh, Barack Obama writing uh, an apologia for his presidency, which would be a defense of what he was able to do and not do. And I think that would be a valuable rhetorical contribution to public discourse. Uh, but instead, we seem to be very much focused on, on charges or, or uh, specific wrongdoings. And classically, um, this comes down to the, uh, the notion of the categoria. Right? So the categoria predates uh, the apologia. Legally speaking, the categoria is the charge or accusation. And then the apologia is the reply to the categoria. And as the, the Greek word suggests, the categoria details um, the, the elements of the accusation, of the alleged wrongdoing. And uh, I just wanted to um, show you this, this uh, 
there, there can be a dispute here between people. So these um, scenes from, uh, it's the, the, what is it, the 30th anniversary of, of Tarantino's Reservoir Dog? So is it 35th? No. Sorry, I mean, 20th? 20th? That seems like longer than that. Uh, 25th, what they 25th, okay. okay. <laughs> Split the difference. So here, um, uh, Mr. Pink and Mr. White, I think, uh, Harvey Keitel and, and Steve Buscemi, having this dispute about the nature of blame laying. And each one of them in this, in this scene is executing an attempted categoria. And then, of course, it escalates <laughs> in their case. Uh, so that can happen in, in uh, our uh, relational structure between accusation and reply. As I said, um, many of these public apologies, celebrity or political apologies in particular, are forced because we have to imagine behind the scenes, uh, the person who's being accused does not want to meet the accusation with any admission until and unless uh, the, the PR costs be start to outweigh the, the benefits of saying that. And of course, we've seen politicians who, you know, and in the current phrase, double down on accusations and turn them around rather than ever offer an apology. Uh, so uh, in sum, it would be interesting to see two things. One is uh, a, a contemporary revival of the apologia as a rhetorical form, the, the, the spiritual slash um, personal defense of oneself. Maybe ironic, but maybe not. Uh, and I think that would be um, very interesting in some, some uh, circumstances. And the second thing is to appreciate the, the structure of this uh, categoria apologia uh, relationship. And in fact, um, certain scholars, um, Yamazaki, for example, um, and uh, Tabuchis have suggested that, in fact, the apologia, rather than being the, the dyadic term to a categoria, is actually a um, this is what um, Tabuchi says in a 1991 publication, um, a middle term in a moral syllabus, um, that there is a kind of logical relationship between charge being brought, reply, and then reply to reply. And so the, the, um, the moral discourse continues through a kind of, uh, not dialectic, and it's, it's not resolved, uh, but but has uh, this sense that uh, the apology is not the end of the matter. Even if it does all the things that we think an apology should do, it's never the end of the discussion about why the charges were brought in the first place. And so that's what, what um, uh, Lazar, Tabuchis, and um, uh, Yamazaki and others call the uh, anap anapologia, right? the anap apologia, um, sort of the uh, counter-apology. So, uh, categoria, apologia, and apologia. Uh, that would be a really interesting rhetorical frame to see in public discourse. Um, that's that's all. Thank you for your attention.